Well, my story is kind of similar to many. Uh, I grew up here in San Diego, family with four kids. My family had a family business. I was always busy working, it seemed like, as a young child. And I remember probably one of the episodes that I benchmarked some of my trajectory to is in second grade. A good friend of mine uh, had gone skiing, fractured his leg, was out of school for a while. He came back and we kind of reconnected and he took his shoe off and he threw it at me. So, you know, being a good friend, I threw it back at him and unfortunately hit the fracture and rebroke his leg. So I was immediately brought into the principal's office and I was uh, kind of profiled as a behavioral problem. This is in second grade now. So I was actually moved to another school, a private school, and things got worse from there. So my early teens, I started, uh, picked up a drink, and I, and I loved it. And I found myself drinking whenever I could. So I used to go up to the fraternity parties. I grew up in the State College area, it was part of where I was in my mid-teens, and I was drinking. Got involved with um, marijuana in high school and some methamphetamine. And as I like to say now, I'm, I'm a former uh, retired unlicensed pharmacist. So I was really busy with that methamphetamine in my teens and 20s. Then got introduced to cocaine, hallucinogen, second all, and I was off and running. But I was working every day and I was busy. So I was productive. So I didn't think I had a problem. And most of my friends were partying. So that's kind of way the process went. was I didn't really think I had a drinking problem. What I found was I really had a depression problem. I felt depressed or I felt anxious or I felt, you know, uh, resentful hope for the fact that I was taking this mood altering in, uh, substances into my body and other people weren't doing it like I was doing it. So I started to ask the question, why do I need this all the time? Why is this something that I require? But that was my afterthought. What during the during those days it was like, you know, hey, I'm working ten hours a day. I deserve this opportunity. You know, I can't get to sleep. I've got to take something to get to sleep. I need something to wake up. So the doctor made some prescriptions for me and I started mixing my chemicals with my prescriptions and I was actually getting higher and feeling more numb. So it really got out of control the last couple of years in my 20s uh, until I got to the fact, the point of, you know, 1984 was my crash year. That was the year that I bottomed out. What I found was I needed to do something and I wasn't sure what it was. And then I finally had a weekend, you know, New York on business, blackout drinking, nearly got arrested on the flight over. And that last day in New York, I decided it was time to end my own life and realized there's no way I'm going to be able to explain this week. I had a week of heavy meetings, didn't make any of them, blackout drinking. The entire team and I were just, you know, separated because I was under the influence. And when I wasn't, I was sleeping. And I was at a guy's office, and it was the 44th floor of this building in Manhattan, and I really wanted to not find a way to explain myself anymore, but I wanted to find a way to end my life. And I literally, there was an open window, it was hot time in November, and I was sitting on the windowsill, and I was prepared to jump out of the window, just fall out, knowing I wouldn't have any more pain. No more explanations, no more excuses, no more trying to frame why I was doing what I was doing. And at the end of the day, uh, this guy walks in and he goes, hey, what are you doing? You're going to fall out the window. Talk about divine intervention. And I remember, you know, I took a second. And I remember hearing my mom's voice when she said, you know, suicide is selfish. Having a good Jewish mother, you know, she made me feel guilty when I thought about it as a kid. But it rang true at that moment. And that's what gave me the opportunity to come in from the window.
Well, you know, I didn't really know I could overcome my addiction. And I, <clears throat> what was fascinating is I didn't even think I had an addiction. What I thought was if I could remove the depression, I wouldn't drink. And if I didn't drink, I wouldn't have the depression. So for me, you know, and I've learned this is a disease of denial. So most people don't even think they have a problem, except everyone else in the family knows they have a problem. And that is there's three words that are really hard to say. And that is, I need help. As a sober human being, my life, uh, you know, is so different today. I mean, when I have a bad feeling, I can process it. When I have a happy feeling, I have a mechanism for it. And I'm very, very embedded in recovery programs. I do a lot of volunteer work. <clears throat> and I find that by being with others really makes a big difference. And I'll tell you, during this particular time in the world where, you know, we're sheltered at home, sheltered in place, being able to get onto a Zoom recovery meeting, talk to other people is so powerful. And I know there are people out there right now that are hurting, that are sitting at home, or they've made decisions, you know, they're just gonna keep drinking and using. But being sober today, to me, really means I can feel my feelings, I can be of service to others, I can really understand what love means, and I can also, if I do something wrong today, I can take feedback from people and instead of drinking and using and self-medicating, I can find a way to fix it.